Good evening. Welcome back to the Other Israel Film Festival. My name is Isaac Zablocki. I'm director of the festival and director of film programs at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight um, and throughout this amazing week. Please, uh, we have, after tonight, we have two more nights. So this is the last chance for you and to, for your friends to see all these films, um, check them all out, tell your friends and help spread the word. Um, we're really excited now to um, invite you to the special conversation of the film's objector. And we paired this with a film and I'm, as we were discussing it in the, in the, um, in the chat room before, um, um, we paired this with Image of Victory, and I'm just loving this pair. I think that um, they really fit together in many complementary ways. Um, so uh, so um, we'll let you connect all the dots, or maybe um, our moderator, Yona Shemtov from Encounter, um, will help you do that um, along with, uh, with our special guests here today, who I'll introduce in a moment. But first, I will tell you what's coming up uh, next tomorrow at 6 p.m. We have the conversation for one more jump, one more jump about um, parkour um, athletes in Gaza. Please join us for that. Um, and then on Thursday night, we have our closing night event at uh, 5 p.m. with the film Laila and Haifa, and an after party with um, uh, that we're calling Chag Chagim, which is a celebration that goes on in Haifa every year, um, a, an interreligious um, celebration of the um, three religions of that city. And we're going to have a special musical event for that. So please sign up for that and join us and mark your calendars. We'll do that in honor of Hanukkah, of course. Um, back to our event now. Um, we're really excited to have here a wonderful panel for you. We have um, the director of Objector, Molly Stewart, here with us. Molly, thank you for joining us. Um, we have the um, protagonist, I'll say, of uh, Objector, um, someone who you're somewhat familiar with, though I understand that her hair has changed. I never noticed these things. Um, Atalia, Atalia Benaba. Atalia, thank you so much for being here. And from Image of Victory, we have the director of the film, who's also the sister of the um, uh, main character in that documentary, um, Adi. Adi, thank you so much for joining us. Adi Mishnayot. And to moderate this, as I mentioned before, Yona Shemtov is the executive director of Encounter. But I want to give a shout out to all of our partners on the festival who are doing amazing work year round on the ground. And these films connect and inspire um, you at all. Please um, um, uh, check out all of our partners on the partner page. Um, but specifically for this film, um, we want, really want to thank um, Encounter, of course, the New Israel Fund, and um, specifically welcome New Gens, the uh, 20s and 30s programs there, and the 20s and 30s program at, um, at the JCC in Manhattan. So thank you to all these groups for coming together and um, join, enjoying these wonderful films and being a part of these conversations. Um, Yona, I'm going to hand things over to you, but reminding the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And then when we get to the Q&A section, we will open the chat and allow you to ask your question um, over, over your microphone. And then at the very end, also, we'll do some breakout sessions to allow people to have uh, take the discussion to the next level. And that's been really nice um, and, and getting to know our neighbors a little bit from around the country. So Yona, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to start by really appreciating the work that you do year round, but especially during this festival. And I was reminded of that as I watched both of these films. It, the festival is such an incredible portal um, into an Israel that we don't often get to see and um, beyond sort of the usual headlines. And these are really stories of courage and grit and connection um, that just kind of not to sound trite, but really energized and inspired me. And I wouldn't have known the stories of Atalia um, or Adi, I wouldn't have known about your film were it not for you and the other Israel Film Festival, Yitzi. So thank you um, again for the work that you do. I want to start um, with Molly, the director um, of Objector, and ask you to tell us a little bit about how you came to do this film, how you came to meet Atalia, and a little bit about that process of sort of gaining the trust both with her and with her family as you moved 
through such sensitive subject matter. Thank you, Yona, and thanks to all the organizers of this festival. It's really wonderful to be a part of it. And for all the audience for tuning in, um, I came to this story through Atelier's brother. Uh, we studied together in college in Vermont and uh, we uh, traveled together to Jerusalem for the first time in 2013, uh, my first time. And uh, that's where I met Atalia. At the time she was still in early high school thinking about what she would do in the army. And uh, after Amitai and I graduated, we stayed in, in close contact. And um, when I heard that she was reconsidering, uh, we decided to make the film and it was a very collaborative effort with Atalia and Amitai. And I was lucky enough to be already a friend of the family. So we started with some trust, but also built, built a lot over the, the next two and a half years. Um, and uh, yeah, we continue uh, and to be collaborating now on the impact project for the film. And uh, Atalia can tell you more about it, but that'll get us started. Okay, great. Well, Atalia um, and Adi, it, it's just interesting. Both of these films, you know, to me felt very much in conversation with one another. And as we were talking about in our prep call, um, you know, there's sort of, there's a syn the synergy between them about the place of IDF service within Israeli society, but even bigger themes than that. I mean, that at least stood out to me. First of all, Gaza looms very large. Um, you know, there's both the West Bank, but certainly in um, an image of victory, Gaza looms large. And it's clear this is a new generation that sort of marks my own age, um, but a generation that doesn't you know, did not grow up with Oslo and sort of instead is growing up with a very different arc um, and also the intergenerational family experience. So I, I kind of want to go to you first, Atelia, and ask you a little bit about this very powerful scene where I don't know if it's your cousin or who is it, the sweet young boy who um, is talking about school and if he'll join the army one day and how he says no. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about your when you came to your own decision, how you came to that awakening um, to decide to say no in the context of like a very intergenerational encounter with your family. So how did you come to that decision? What was sort of your own story of coming to that? And how did that play out across this different generations within your family? So first of all, I also want to thank all of you for inviting us and for being here. And so the conversation that you're referring to is with my nephew, <laughs> Dori. Um, and I think for me, um, thinking about, you know, the, the different generations and how they, they view, I think, the occupation, it's I think with my parents, they had this this like hopefulness of like, maybe my children won't have to enlist to the military. And I think for my mother always says that she didn't think, like she didn't think the occupation was here to stay. She didn't view it as like a, a, a status quo that we're entering. Um, so, for me that that's you know my that's how I know this place and that's like in a way it's I can't imagine like I, I try to but it's hard to imagine uh, the the post-occupation um, reality so so I think it, it felt a lot more urgent to 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 do something about it to choose a way of of an action uh, towards the occupation, uh, and thinking about you know the earlier generation, there's the conversation with my grandfather who has this whole different uh, point of view. He you know he he talks about the the Holocaust and about Jewish people having to protect themselves, and I think that is you know I grew up so differently. It's not even like that's that those are not my concerns 
Um, I think my concerns uh, were and still are turned towards, uh, you know, the <laughs> the human va right violations that we we um, live in. And that we, uh, how did start. you how did you come to be up close to that? Like to you know to meet Osama to be in the field. Like what was the process that led you actually? to being Bashetach, like in the field and seeing it up close for yourself? So I think, first of all, I grew up um, in Musrara, which is, it's like really um, on the, like the intersection maybe between uh, West Jerusalem and in East Jerusalem. So like half of the neighborhood is, is East Jerusalem and East Jerusalem is, is a very, uh, well, the occupation is very apparent there, and uh, it's it's like the Palestinian part of Jerusalem, and there there they have been and still are so many struggles going on there. Uh, I think, uh, for example, now I'm very involved uh, with the struggle in Sheikh Jarrah, where they're just evacuating families from their home, like. Uh, 40 people are being thrown away from their home because they're not Jewish. So I, th that's where I grew up. Um, so, so that's one part of, you know, just always being like that, that that's life. Um, but on the other hand, you know, many people grow up in many places and still aren't uh, caring or whatever. But uh, my brother was a big influence for me and he was sort of the person that took me um, to the Jordan Valley and got me involved and and um, yeah and just taught me about it. Yeah, thank you, um, Adi. It's also sort of a sibling relationship. It's interesting here the intimacy between a sister and a brother. And I guess I have the same question for you in your sort of in. How did you come to make this film? And sort of what's the context of your family features sort of in the, in the background, in the foreground of this film? Like give us a little bit of the context that shaped your lens on this and to making the film. Sure, so hi everyone and thanks for coming. Um, so really um, I would have to say, uh, the starting point of the film is, of course, very different because uh, it was not a planned uh, film. Um, and I uh, literally just picked up a camera because what I was seeing around me was so overwhelming. I felt a sense that I had to document it. Um, and to, to, just to give a little context, so uh, my brother Uri was in the is mandatory service as a combat soldier. Uh, and he was very close to actually the end of the, his service when the Operation Protective Edge uh, uh, began in the summer of 2014. Uh, so obviously it was a very stressful time. And then uh, when we got the news and uh, we went to the hospital, uh, we were just so surprised by what we found there because the war was so severe, uh, both like in the atmosphere, I think in Israel, both in the streets. Uh, I went to some protests that got really physical and violent, like, um, and also I think what we got from the news every day and also having so many casualties. So uh, it was just like quite an horrendous time. But when we got to the hospital, I discovered this world that I never knew even existed actually. And I probably would have never even known that this happens had we not been there by, you know. Um, and that was originally what drove me to kind of document everything. And I think, as you said, it's also kind of like an intimacy thing of just like a way for me as like this, I'm a filmmaker, this is how I know to be. So a way to be with my brother every day is just filming it, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't, you can't really help someone who's in rehabilitation. All you can do is just be there. So it was a good way for me to be there. Um, 
And actually, I've I think I really uh, decided to make the film only about a year later, even though I, I, I kind of, um, I had this, it was so intuitive. So I kind of kept documenting even after we were released from the hospital, but uh, I could hardly look at the materials. Um, and also like the rehabilitation process was still ongoing and or he was getting better and kind of putting this, this thing behind him in a way. So it's really hard to kind of go back and dwell on this hard time. But I feel like a year after the operation, um, all the news channels, right? They do this, okay, it's a year for protective edge and they do like all the newscasts. And then you see the same story going again and again and again in the news. And there is this only one narrative of what this war was and what our soldiers feel, right? And what the families of the soldiers feel. So I think that for me was like, this is an untold story and I can't let this go. I feel like this has, I have to be able to say my piece, you know? So this is, was really the Can drive I ask, to do it. I wanna ask both you and Molly, um, and then I'll come back to Atalia, and I'm not a filmmaker, but I'm very curious about sort of the artistic choices you both made in terms of how you filmed it. So there were a lot of moments of kind of quiet and of taking things in and of like a shot to the news or a shot very subtly seeing your mom's face, you know, being overwhelmed clearly, like it evoked a lot of feeling. And yet there wasn't a lot of, um, not even chatter. There wasn't, it wasn't being verbalized, but it was very apparent. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, your choices? And then Molly, I kind of want to hear from you, sort of the choices you made in terms of bringing out Atelier's courage and vulnerability, et cetera. So Adi, you first, please. Sure. So um, this was a really uh, interesting and like really a journey uh, that uh, a lot of it I did with uh, the film editor, uh, which is like just a joint like uh, director and editor uh, work that was really wonderful for me. Um, and we were really debating about this for a long time. Like I, and as I said, like I kept actually following the family. I did interviews. I did all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and I think also when you go through like the, um, you know, fund like raising funds for the film and this and that. So a lot of people were like uh, looking for it, you know, like looking for like, okay, so like, who's the hero really? And what do you have to say? And um, so for a long time, I really debated it, but Ultimately, we felt, first of all, the material spoke so loud for themselves. And also, I think it's really important for me to say this actually here in other Israel, because I'm, I'm so happy to now be sharing the film um, with uh, like really across the world and also with both Jewish and non-Jewish communities. So this conversation is really amazing and different, but it is important for me to say that this film was uh, first and foremost made for an Israeli audience. And we really felt that uh, we wanted to be very delicate and uh, really allow people to feel as if they are the sister of this wounded soldiers and really like feeling it and taking it in. And I felt like whatever opinions I have, um, they won't speak louder than the looks on my parents' faces. And they actually will, especially for an Israeli audience, could estrange people so easily. Yes. Um, so we really felt like this delicacy is something that is very called for. And also because the experience itself was truly ambivalent. Yes. But for me, like artistically, it was just a joy uh, to actually strip it from like, okay, we don't need the voiceover, we don't need the interviews, like, so I'm quite, it's actually, I'm quite proud of it, like artistically as well, that we did that. And in less than 30 minutes. I mean, it's really, I, I, for those of you that haven't seen it, I urge you uh, to make time to watch it. Molly, the, your film, the objector is very different, obviously in substance and in the storytelling and the protagonist. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the choices 
um, that you made and sort of what, what was the essence of what you were trying to get at? Yeah, I, I agree that it's very different, but I, I also relate to what Adi is saying in terms of starting with uh, many different sort of stylistic uh, ideas. We also did lots of interviews um, that did not make it into the film and decided to more narrowly focus on the family and the conversations that I think, uh, as Adi is saying, like you can't uh, really beat the kind of emotion that and and experience that comes through in in those conversations with kind of scripted um or or seated interviews so i think um in terms of what what i was trying to to get across in these more observational scenes um and at times the the more edited um emotional scenes with, like the the montage for instance is uh what really inspired me initially about Atelia which was her ability to kind of constantly seek truth from from everyone around her and her interest in learning even after she would make a bold decision you know um and and even if she didn't feel fully prepared all the time um to be you know, hoisted up into the spotlight, she was willing to 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 make a bold decision and continue learning from those around her and continue questioning. So I hope that's that's what came Yeah, out. yeah. No, what came across, I mean, Atalia, you um, inhabited something that's so rare, which is like raw courage. And yet there was something gentle and very loving in your courage. Um, you were not combative, even in the different conversations and even in how you spoke, it felt like it was flowing really from a place of love, like love of place, love of country, love of what should be. Um, I'm curious, I guess I want to hear a little bit from you about how it's been received, have Israeli audiences seen this, how you've been sort of received. Um, there's this one powerful um, scene where you're sitting with your girlfriends and you sort of like you're just taking in how they're all talking about it and I just was like wow I wonder what's going on for her and I guess for me my question is like are you is there a story about this new generation of Israelis coming out like are you part of this you know is there an awakening happening are you part of an you know growing awakening First of all, thank you. That was very uh, touching. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I always find that it's sort of hard for me to answer. Is there a, a, a growing movement or an awakening? Uh, because I, I am a part of a movement. Um, I'm a part of Mesovot, which is a refusal movement in Israel. Um, and it is growing. And we're... Uh, working on another uh, big refusal letter, which I'm too old to sign now, but uh, it's a Shministim letter, which means that it's a letter that people who are uh, just finishing high school and are supposed to enlist, uh, they're writing this, this really amazing, and they, they wrote this letter for an entire year, thinking about it and learning more. So, so there is this like really inspiring and, um, new group of youth who are entering our, our refusal movement. Um, so for me, it does feel like there are more people and, and I, I very much don't feel alone in my activism. I'm a part of a group and I, and also just like here in Jerusalem, but all over the world, I feel there are more people who are involved. And especially now in Israel, we have like this whole summer that has been full of just this huge demonstrations going on um, at Balfour in Jerusalem. Just, um, you know, so for me, this there is this feeling of change. But on the other hand, you know, there's the like the, I don't know, the backlash, but not, not even that. I think like the radical right, um, in Israel, but also all over the world has been getting louder and and scarier and more violent and more aggressive. So, so it's it's hard to tell. 
which directions uh, which direction we are going by then all the the I'd like to ask you, I don't know if it's too personal to ask you, but, you know, we see a lot of your parents who are also courageous, I think, like, and willing to be on film. And it's so sensitive. Like, as a mother, I can't imagine speaking on film about, you know, these this subject. Um, so I kind of want to ask, actually, before I get to your parents, about your friends. Like, what about your friends that went? And, and were you able... Where does friendship lie when you're sort of making these very different choices? It's complicated. I think a lot of my my current friends, uh, most of them didn't enlist, and you know, a lot of them are refusers. I mean, uh, we, me and the other uh, refusers, became really good friends. So, so a lot of my friends, we we had this similar experience, and we we share a, a worldview, and we. We act, we do activism together. Uh, but I also have friends who didn't list. And uh, I think uh, like a lot, many friends who didn't list. And uh, I think a lot of them, I won't say they regret their what they did, but I think uh, certainly um, we do share a political worldview uh, and we do, um, I don't know, um, I, I think it's hard for me um, to, I, I can't find the exact words, but I think in a way it's, it's, it's difficult because it's not that I condemn soldiers. I definitely don't do that and I don't uh, try to, to, you know, to pass a moral judgment on anyone. Uh, that's not what I tend to do, and my criticism is is very systematic. Mm -hmm. And like I criticize the system who is, um, you know, uh, enforcing military law over millions of Palestinians. So, so it it doesn't it I don't turn it towards soldiers or or people who have enlisted. So, so it shouldn't be and like a strain on my relationship with people who have been to right military. right it's not you're not passing personal judgment on people who choose to serve your critique is on the system that sort of is perpetuating an ongoing situation um i guess we'll go to one last question for each of you and i sort of just want to invite you if you wanted to expand atalia you had this moment in conversation where you were talking about um, women's leadership, sort of like leaning into inhabiting the future differently. And it's not about sort of copying the men. And in a society where we so often heard of like, you know, the machismo Israeli and male soldier, I'm kind of interested to hear from both you and Adi, um, you know, what you think about that, what you might say about that. The role of women, I guess, Atalia, why don't you share a little bit more about that and then we'll go to Adi, the role, how you were sort of leaning into a feminist read on this. Uh, so for me being a, an, a conscientious objector is definitely a feminist um, statement. And uh, I think there's this like, and I've talked about this in the film, but there's this view of, you know, like the feminist woman, she, she's like a Wonder Woman and she fights and she's like the man and she's so strong. And I feel like that's a, such a, a misleading way of representing feminism mm -hmm. uh, because being feminist is, is, you know, first of all, it's about equality and it's about creating an equal society where all people Definitely, no matter what their gender, but also what their race or their religion, uh, all people can live safely and freely. Um, so fighting an occupation <laughs> is a feminist struggle. Uh, but also, you know, the mythology of mytholo methodology of the struggle um, is, is like this idea of we, that we, we don't want to use violence and we don't want to use aggression we want to use communication and we want to use these tools of reaching out to other people and and listening to them so so we we also try to you know to 
step away from from like this this you know macho machoism yes. and, and and like this like very rigid rules of of like um of like that that that's like how you're supposed to act because they're of like this separation of of people from one another and yeah so for it's me like a it's, culture shift yes it's a culture shift. Adi, I, I'm curious to hear your take just because um, there did, for me anyways, feel like these tropes, the sort of like um, hums of the masculinity, you know, your brother's commander who comes back in a sort of like scoffing it off. We were having a good time and Bar Raffaele coming in and even this sort of interesting moment of the the girls from the yeshiva in Brooklyn, sort of the flirt, flirtatiousness with the wounded soldier. I'm kind of curious. I don't know. Do you have anything to say around sort of like the masculinity, masculinity within Israeli society as it relates to, you know, army service and the occupation? Yeah, sure. So I, I in that sense, I really feel these are two uh, very like uh, feministic films in their point of view. Also. Um, I actually even did a, a seminar a while back of like, it was called when, when women directors do films on men or something like that, wow. like in a translated poorly from Hebrew, but forgive me. <laughs> but yeah, but I really do feel that my point of view is different uh, because I, I didn't experience that very... I think there is also, the, first of all, yes, I think masculinity is very apparent in the film. And you can also even notice that, like, even the um, staff in the hospital, they're like, you're the man. Isn't he the man, right? So this thing of heroism is, is of course, very masculine. And um, I feel like uh, me not having this experience of serving in that way and not knowing what is inside Gaza and the way that I look at those materials, um, I really do feel like it allowed me to look at this whole um, role uh, that a soldier is carrying in the eyes of society in kind of a different way. And um, also, I think like uh, it, it happened like it's so layered, as you say, it's like with the commander of like saying, uh, are you even allowed to look at something as if it was uh, scary or whatever? And even like uh, also something very powerful is the women in the film. Uh, there is a moment where uh, some visitors come up to my mom and they're like, mother, thank you for your son. Yes, which I think was also very, very powerful and really like it really exemplifies what you are actually saying of yeah. how this whole system uh, looks at our roles as as you know, like as uh, mothers or sisters or um, so I really do feel like it is a stance about about really like what how macho uh, Israeli society is. Um, definitely. Well, I'm going to pass it back to the other Israel Film Festival folks, but I'm just grateful, Molly, Atalia, Adi. Um, it gives me a lot of hope. I'm drawing energy from your courage and what you've put out there. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Yona, for the very thoughtful questions. And please feel free to chime in wherever um, you feel relevant. Um, I see a lot of great questions in the chat, and we're going to start with a question from Cheryl. Hi, um, I'm going to ask Adi a question. Um, there was a lot of talk about the expression on her parents' face, but nobody questioned the expression on Uri's face while he was in the hospital. And I was struck so strongly by that. I kept watching him throughout the film, and he was smiling in a way that made me feel like he really wanted to cry. How does he feel about this heroism attitude, this macho attitude, and the way people were calling him, you know, the Gevil and, and all this wonderful thing that he did? 
So um, thank you uh, for this uh, insight. Um, it really is a, a complicated thing. I can also relate to uh, something that was mentioned in the conversation earlier about this kind of generational uh, difference of how like on the one hand, uh, Uri was born in this kind of generation where, um, you know, like uh, just for instance, but Benjamin Netanyahu was probably the first prime minister that he maybe remembers to, to recall who he was. So uh, definitely, I think for Uri's generation, uh, this state of war is kind of something that feels like this is our, like our, our uh, like a force of nature that, uh, <laughs> that this is ju just the state of things, which I think um, really, but it doesn't make it any less, um, any less absurd. I think that he felt this absurdity as he was treated as a hero. Uh, what I do have, I have to say about what you're saying is that um, it's very ambivalent because he was really still enlisted. He really had to play that part. He was expected to play that part. And it's, and really, you know, people came with very good intentions. Uh, they were feeling in pain as well. And they, I, I think Israel is just like, has this thing of like people having such amazing solidarity and energy, but not knowing how to turn it into good. Like they feel the war is wrong. They want to do something, but you can't, you're not really allowed to do anything that is outside uh, commemorating the soldiers. I think maybe they can, uh, Atalia maybe can talk about it a little later because I think they mentioned it a lot in the film. Like you're either very much marginalized or most people who do want to feel part of society and they feel bad, they want to do something, they go to, to the hospital to, make some soldier happy. So I think my brother really felt the duty to not let these people go empty handed. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I always say this, like you have to remember that uh, even though he was in a lot of pain and had this very hard uh, rehabilitation process, he was actually uh, mildly injured. And a lot of the people who were there were in the room with him were in much worse shape and mm -hmm. could really not accept any visitors. Uh, so he really felt like, well, I, I'm in a physical state that at least I could uh, wave to these people and like make them feel good, you know? Thank you. We have a question from John. Okay. John, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is John. John Ostfield. I live in the Midwest in the U.S. And during the American War against Vietnam, I was a draft refuser. I was lucky, like um, most people, I didn't go to jail. We overwhelmed the system with our refusal. And for every person who stood up, there must have been a hundred or more who went to Dr. Feelgood to get another way out. What I want to know is how can we help you? Because I remember how lonely it was um, to be isolated from the society. And this is, people are telling you that you're, uh, you're a traitor. And at you know, 17, 18, 19 years old, well, what if they're right? And um, I believe in a concept of Lador Vador from generation to generation. We need to, we need to help. And I think we need to get Jewish kids from South Africa who are somewhere in the middle. You know, I'm in my 70s. They're in their 40s and 50s who also went through the same way, making an international solidarity with, mm -hmm. with, uh, with refusal. Because people here, American Jews, don't even know that you exist. So um, I'd love to pursue this further, but I would like to this 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 kind of discussion and topic to, 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 to go somewhere with that. Um, and uh, Atalia, todal raba, yesh lach koach v'oz. Thank you, John. 
I, I can uh, respond to that and then uh, Talia may add. So uh, in terms of how we can support uh, show solidarity from the US, uh, we have a letter that accompanies the Shmini steam letter that, that Atalia mentioned, that is for international solidarity. And the, the letter calls on the Israeli government to stop imprisoning conscientious objectors that object to the occupation. And this is uh, available on, on our website, objectivefilm.com. You can sign it there. Um, and also right now, we're, we're generating uh, a list of some cultural figure influencers and, um, and high profile people to help um, get some publicity for the letter before we send it in uh, as well um, to accompany the, the Shmini Steam letter. And it's, it's always great to have a, an American CEO uh, on, on these calls these Q and A's and to connect the struggles here and there. And uh, so thank you for sharing your experience. Atalia, did you want to add anything? First of all, I agree with Molly. Um, it's always uh, so special to hear from people, um, from other CEOs, from other, uh, I don't know, places. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, as Molly said, uh, we do have the letter accompanying, accompanying sorry, uh, the Shmini Steam letter. Um, and yeah, I think I don't have like a, another answer of the, like how, how do you help? Because I think we're all sort of trying to find the best way to, uh, to struggle. But I do want to emphasize that, you know, um, we, we try to uplift, um, you know, Palestinian voices. And I think I, I'm still in a very privileged place uh, being an Ashkenazi Jew in Israel. Um, like, like, I don't feel like I'm the one that needs, uh, needs help. And I, it's not like I want to say, you know, Palestinians need, need help. That's not it at all. But what I'm trying to say is that we should turn our focus to how how do we support uh, Palestinians in their struggle? There's a lot of questions from the audience. I'm sorry, I, I had to ask a question. <laughs> and it goes basically to both filmmakers. Um, I, watching these films, I also grew up in Israel and served in the army actually, and, um, and have been finding in the experience of this festival that there are, that, that in Israel, there's a lack of self-reflection in terms of specifically, of a lot of things, but specifically the IDF, specifically in the army. And especially, I know this, when I was an 18 year old, that, that I did not realize what the army meant. I heard only good things about the army. Um, and it took many years for me to really understand understand what the IDF was completely and, and really all the players in the part. I asked this to both filmmakers and both, and, and of course I'll tell you, how did you figure this out? Why aren't, aren't most people figuring this out? That, that there's, there's a more complex picture here, obviously. Yes. Okay, maybe I'll start. Um, I have to say that um, I grew up in a place where actually um, I think like Israel is of course very kind of like uh, there's a lot of different communities and where you grow up plays a really uh, central uh, part in the conversation that is um, happening or not happening regarding these issues. And I actually grew up in a place where there was kind of always a conversation about uh, military service and about like the morality of what's going on in the occupied territories. So I, I, I it's not, I, I did not feel that way. Like we did not grow up in a place where this was, I think in a way it's interesting because I, I, I think that maybe uh, ourselves and Natalia, well, not, not maybe from a very similar background, but like from a rather similar background of like uh, a Zionist uh, liberal, Israeli family, 
uh, were, of course, everybody served in the army, but also people that really were, as Atalia said, were looking at the occupation as something temporary, something that should pass from the world. And like my parents really believed uh, in the 90s that we are heading that way, as many in their generation believed. So I, so I really think for me, it, it's not like that. It's, it's more like I think a lot of the people in my surroundings kind of went to the army as a way of like saying like, we really feel it's our civic duty and we feel like we're uh, as citizens who want to be uh, like a contributing part of society. And this is the law. So we feel like this is what like a contributing citizen is doing, you know? And I think, but, but and, and this is really the, the thing, I think that we in Israel are living in a state of like uh, trying to play by rules that are normal while the situation itself is actually not that. Uh, so I think there is like this inevitable clash really um, and, and so, so, cause you know, my brother says in the film, like, you know, it's all like all is vanity and there is nothing new under the sun. He didn't enlist feeling like he heard only good things and it's going to be a wild ride. He really did not. Uh, he, 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 he I think he and many of his friends are like, this is just our fate in this land. Uh, this is the circle that we're in. And the, the whole war is like this vicious circle of everybody knows it's gonna happen again. I think even like, even if you have very radical right-wing views, a war is something that should change reality, right? It's like a crisis that you should arise from like as a different country or if a different reality. But really I think what is so severe in the state that we are in right now in Israel is that everybody has accepted it to be just rounds, recurring rounds of violence that nobody even uh, thought to themselves that after 2014, anything will be different. Um, so, so, I think, so I think that is like what really get, got to me in regards to this, uh, whether you go to the army or you don't, but this is like, this normality or the, the fake normality that we have to pay attention to and see what do we do to change it. Yeah, I really agree with that, Dee. I think the state of mind, you know, especially thinking also to, to 2014, it was like, oh, every two years we have a war at summer. And it's such a, like a, there, there is no way of breaking it. There's no reason it should change, or like we all hope it would change, but we don't know how and why, or and we don't take an active part in it. And I think, um, it it isn't really mentioned in the film, but I was in a shnatshurut, like in a gap year, and I was supposed to enlist to the Nachal program, which is like a very <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> that's what all left, like center left wing people in Israel do, because that's like the ethical way of being a soldier is like, I know there's an occupation and I know it's bad and all my friends know that there's an occupation and that it's bad. So we all enlist together to the military to be like the better soldier. And, and, and that's really, that was my narrative. And that's the narrative of most people I know. That's like, that's what my so social circle does. It's like being like uh, in, the, in the education corps or, you know, being like engaged in, in the military system in a way that, that fits like our, our general worldview. And I think because, because there's this like adaptation of the military towards these people so so it's easy to like you know it's comfortable in a way but so everyone has a bad time in the military but but they don't they don't betray who they are and they don't they don't feel as 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 though they're like committing you know uh, human rights violations so 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 the system allows allows this like integration of people with all different like political views so so it's 
so I think that's why it's so hard to to be like no I I cannot be a part of it um and for me I I, I think I would have enlisted at, unless I knew someone else that objected and, and and for me that's the power of like a refusal movement because once once you know somebody that refused only for me at least only then it becomes like a, a thing that I could actually do thank you um we have a question from Dina Dina you're on the air hi um, two really fantastic, powerful, and courageous films, both, I think. So thank you. So I had a question um, because it came up in uh, the movie The Objector when your parents are kind of trying to influence you to uh, join. And they say that it's better to be inside the system and learn about the system. So um, I was wondering, since change makers and activists are constantly asking this question, about whether it's better to change from the inside or change from the outside. And I'm wondering today whether you think that, like, do you, uh, does a part of you wish you kind of had served and could say that you had been in the army or do you think it's just as powerful not to be? And I was also, I mentioned in my comment that I was also thinking of Shovrim Shtika, which are soldiers that have served, but still are getting a lot of trouble by speaking up, thank you. for the question and um, I for me I feel like I, I made the right choice and I, I I don't think the the military system is one that that I at least have the power to change from within and I think most people don't because it is a very hierarchical system so in order to to change this you need to go up the hierarchy and that's I know somebody who's trying to do that, but that's. <laughs> um, um, but can I just say, I actually meant, do you think that you would have more, you would get more um, power for trying to change when people knew that you had served? Yeah. Um, I think that's a problem in, in the Israeli mindset that there's this idea that only if you've been there, you can talk about it. And only if you've been a part of it, you can criticize it. I think that's a very problematic idea that is mainly there to create uh, denial and silence. Um, I mean, it's, you, you don't have to, to be a part of the military in order to criticize it in my eyes. I think that's only a way to try to delegitimate people who are criticizing it from the outside. And this sort of like, uh, you know, this practice of like, uh, first we shoot, then we cry. And um, I think it's what uh, breaking the silence are doing is very, very important and very, you know, powerful. But But I don't. I don't think that's the the only way. Um, and I think uh, we shouldn't just like um, accept the fact that that people who don't serve have like less power to criticize. Uh, I don't think we should play into it. Um, We have time for one last question from Mark. Mark, you're on the air. Um, I think I'm unmuted. Hi. Um, I, th I thought it was great, the juxtapos juxtaposition between these two films. It was really important to and, and striking, particularly because I, I guess what we found out now a little bit more, Ori was opposed to, the, to being in the army in, in many ways, or at least opposed to some of the actions that were happening. And you and your brother, um, had very different reasoning behind why they why you didn't serve. Um, you know, it was touched upon a little bit, but I think it's it's very important for me to understand how what conversations happened between um, Atalia and her brother um, outside of the, the the imposition of the film about his choice to take a medical um, deferral and her ch and, and Atalia's choice to take a very profound statement that was really reflected very strongly and in the reenactment of, of the court case. Um, 
you know, how, how you, the two of you saw those reasonings, reasons as different and how Israeli society currently sees those three reasons as different and how it affects um, your life going forward. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, well, Amitai is, is a lot old, a lot. He's older than me, <laughs> he's six years older than me. Um, so when he uh, chose not to enlist, I I thought he was crazy. <laughs> like I, it, it was the first person I ever met who, who choose not to enlist. Uh, and it was very hard for me uh, to process it. And it was, and I was mainly scared that he, that I'll never, um, that, I, I'll, that I'll lose, that I'll lose him in a way, because um, it was, uh, it was like a rift in our family. Like people uh, were very mad at him and, and it sort of felt like he's going to just like leave Israel, that he can't uh, stay a part of the family anymore if you want the list. Um, so it was, it was difficult. Um, so I, I, I've never thought of like, you know, criticizing him for, for not becoming a, an objector uh, because <laughs> for me, what he did at the time was so radical and so brave. And he was so committed to his morals and to his like point of view even though everyone everyone I knew was telling him that he's doing the wrong choice and making the wrong choice. Um, and, uh, and for me, he, he was like the main supporter I had in, in our family and in my friend group. And like he, he was the person I could turn to and ask and ask like the, the hard questions. I, I really remember a conversation we had uh, I, I was in the Nachel seminars and, and there that, that was like seminars that are supposed to tell you why you should enlist to this specific program in the family in the military and they were really talking about how we have the power to change it from the inside and and be the different soldiers and I and I came to him and I and I asked him like I don't know what should I do and he was and and then we had like a very long deep conversation about can you change it from the inside yeah, so he was really that person for me. Um, so that's... Um... I'll just add quickly, um, Amitai is not here. He sends his regards. Um, he wishes he could be here. But uh, one thing that he um, and the whole objector network that Atalia is part of try to emphasize is that every, every form of refusal, even if it does not result in imprisonment, is... Uh, is important to uplift and um, in the way that the that his his sort of gray refusal or subtle refusal uh, allowed these conversations to be opened with uh, with Atalia and with other people in his life um, are so important in and in, in the result that you see in the film and also I think when when there is a new identity for people who don't refuse. Um, that's whether or not you you go to the military, if you can identify as as an objector, or uh, whether or not you you go to military prison. That's what I meant. If you can identify as a, an objector, then um, then this movement can grow, and um, and that support between youth can be much bigger than just um, those who who are able to actually go to prison. Um, thank you. And just to close the circle, Adi, how is your brother doing? And um, how, what is his part in all of this? Okay. Yeah, this is a question that uh, many times uh, come up when finishing the film, uh, which, by the way, uh, it's interesting because I also got some comments like in the beginning of like, don't you want to close the film, though, in telling the audience like, how Uri is and how he rehabilitated uh, to kind of make, you know, like a happier end to the story. Um, I did get that a lot in the video. Yeah, and for, and for me, it was obvious that, that no, I, this is 
uh, we, we did a lot of thinking about the final scene of the movie. Uh, I will say, like, my brother is just now uh, finishing his BA in the university, and he's, he's extremely well uh, recovered, uh, which is, of course, very joyous for us. And what I always tell people when they ask is, like, if you see him walking down the street, you wouldn't be able to tell that he was injured. And just think how many young Israeli men walk amongst us with these stories and we don't even realize that. Um, because also one thing that it is important to keep in mind is I think like our society is so like enlisted in its culture, but really it's not so many of the soldiers who actually see the occupied territories from inside in the way that you see so rawly in the footages from Gaza. And I think that there is also a lot of like a um, silent cycle uh, with these, again, you mentioned also breaking the silence, which I think also is like a super important organization because they really do break it. There is a silent circle around these things. and. I feel like um, it was really felt in the hospital that maybe some of the visitors do know this experience. Some of them do not. Many of them uh, did not see anything from Gaza the whole time, do not even realize what this looks like on the other side. Uh, so yeah, so, so, so again, like with, the, the, with ending the film, it was really important for me to end it in this way that he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm unforgettable, right? But, but you think to yourself, well, probably in a few years, there is some other soldier sitting in his chair. This is not over. Even though, again, for us personally, uh, he was recovered very well. We're so grateful. And this is very ambivalent because there is always the personal and, and very fa like the family side of it. So. Thank you. Um, just before we go to our breakout sessions, Atalia and Molly, what are you working on right now? Molly, you want to go first? Sure. So, uh, I mean, primarily we are working on the uh, distribution of this film in Israel-Palestine right now, also in the U.S. and around the world, but um, we just premiered the film at the Solidarity Tel Aviv film festival in Israel and uh, now have plans for the launch of this letter and collaboration with Masarvot, the objector movement, to do screenings in, in high schools and youth movements there. Um, and also in the US um, in community organizations and faith-based faith groups. And if you're interested in screening the film for your, for your um, organization of faith or community group, please uh, get in touch on our website. Um, and yeah, we're really just prioritizing getting getting this out in the world right now. I tell ya. I don't think I have anything to add. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I want to give a big thanks, of course, to um, our participants here, Molly, Adi, and Atalia, and a huge thank you to Yona Shemtov from Encounter um, for leading this conversation. Thank you all for participating. Of course, join us um, tomorrow and closing nice and tell your friends. But um, uh, before we let you leave, we want to give you an opportunity to really spend some more time digesting this and talking about it. So please join us for um, small breakout sessions for just um, four or five minutes and um, we'll divide you up into groups. You can join in. I'll leave you with the question of what struck you from each of these films and, um, and why, um, or maybe from the conversation, what was uh, most striking to you? What's something that stayed with you? Um, and please introduce yourselves. Don't speak for more than a minute because then you're using up all the time um, and get to know your neighbors from around the country. Um, thank you all. And we'll send you now to your breakout rooms. Welcome back folks. Hope you all had good conversations and I know that you were, that there was not enough time and <laughs> you were hungry for more and that's how we like to leave you. So join us again um, tomorrow and uh, please do tell your friends and most importantly, please stay safe everyone. Um, thank you very much, um, and we'll see you soon. Have a good night.